Welcome to Cross Connection Church Online. I'm Pastor Garrett, and we at Cross Connection Church are so grateful that you are joining us for our service today. Um, if you'd like to know more about Cross Connection Church, please check us out on our website at lifeinconnection.com, where you'll find out more about us, events coming up, and ways to get plugged in at Cross Connection Church. Also, because you're watching virtually from home, and we love that, that we get the opportunity to, to serve you um, at a distance virtually, We'd love to know a little bit more about you though um, and be encouraged by you. So if you would be as kind as to take a quick video of you and whoever you're watching this broadcast with and just let us know who you are and where you're watching from and you could send that to the number 760-814-1223 and our pastors and staff would be greatly encouraged to, uh, to see how our broadcast is being received. And of course, please stick around to the end of the broadcast today and you'll find some announcements of things that are going on currently at Cross Connection Church and ways for you to get plugged in. And if you would like to give um, today and support the ministry of Cross Connection Church, you can do so right now online from your house at give.lifeinconnection.com. shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out Hey, Cross Connection Church, it's Pastor Garrett here, and today we are going to be looking and studying the largest revival recorded for us in the pages of Scripture, namely in the book of Jonah. If you haven't been with us or you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, the last two weeks we've been going through Jonah. Um, Pastor Jason had Jonah chapter 1 uh, two weeks ago, and last week Pastor Mark taught us through Jonah chapter 2. So as we continue the story of Jonah in Jonah chapter 3, we're going to be looking at what I consider to be the largest revival, and many consider to be the largest revival recorded for us in the pages of Scripture. It's a wicked Assyrian city named Nineveh. And if you'd like to right now, go ahead and turn your Bibles open to um, Jonah chapter 3. Um, but this wicked city uh, named Nineveh, with about 175,000 occupants, uh, miraculously repent and avoid God's righteous judgment. So how does this happen? Um, it happens, I think, when we have a loving, merciful God who uses ordinary people and obedient people. The story of the prophet of Jonah really is the story of our merciful God. That unlike other gods that have been worshipped throughout history, 
God in his mercy is known for giving second chances. And Jonah chapter 3 really is the, the key chapter, I think, in the Bible of God revealing that he's a God of second chances, a God of all peoples, all nations, all tribes, all languages, that he cares for us, and that he's a God that's known for his mercy and a God that's known for giving second chances. But you see, giving second chances, I don't think, is a natural part of humanity's fallen nature. Um, even for the prophet of God, Jonah, giving a second chance was not a natural part of what he liked to do. In fact, a lot of us, um, if we could, we just would give one strike and you're out policy, right? It's uh, you messed up. I don't want to deal with you ever again. You mistreated me. I'm never going to give you a second chance. You see, I do think that our God gives us this great image of being a God of second chances here in Jonah chapter 3. So quick recap of the book of Jonah. Chapter 1, God speaks to Jonah. Chapter 2, Jonah speaks to God from the belly of the whale. Chapter 3, God speaks through Jonah to the people of Nineveh. In chapter 1, God told Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to this wicked Assyrian city named Nineveh, and I want you to tell them what I tell you to tell them, basically. And Jonah says no and he flees. Chapter 2 is what happens when he flees and he runs from God and he's in the belly of the whale, the consequences of sin. Point number one, if you're following along on the outline, is this. Our disobedience to God has divine consequences. I'll say that again. Our disobedience to God has divine consequences. You see, in chapter 2, sin led Jonah down quite literally, actually, into the depths. And three days and three nights, Jonah cried out to God and repented. And God causes this fish to spit up Jonah onto dry land. And really, the, this, this great fish that swallowed Jonah, um, I do believe that this actually happened. Um, Jesus believed it happened. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But this great fish was a very minor part of the story. And let me just say in passing, really quick, as we start this, that I do believe that this fish was the vehicle that God used for his divine mercy. The fish was God's vehicle of divine mercy. Essentially, it was God's divine Uber. It got Jonah from a place of disobedience, where he shouldn't have been, back in line with God's will in a place of obedience, right, where he needed to be. So you might be in a place where you feel utterly stuck, unable to speak, isolated, a place where you, I mean, Pardon the pun, but it really stinks to be where you're at right now. You see, when Jonah's in this fish, you have to realize that he's isolated, he's alone, there's nobody to speak to for three and a half days. The only thing he can do is pray to God. Imagine being stuck in one place, you can't move, you can't talk to anybody, you can't see anything, it's utter darkness, it stinks. Some of you, though, are in this place. And sometimes God uses um, means like a great fish to bring us from one place, a place of disobedience, a place where we're running from God, to a place of obedience where we need to be. And I want you to consider that if God used this great fish for Jonah, what might he use in your life? Why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? You see, Pastor Mark last week talked a little bit about the possibilities of why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh, that they were incredibly violent, wicked people, and they did some terrible things to the Hebrews in the Old Testament. That's all very true. But it wasn't just the evil of the city. Um, was the, that's not just, it wasn't just the evil. In fact, that word for evil really could also be translated into the great distress of that city. Um, you see that sin not only leads us down individually into darkness like Jonah, but sin also leads us corporately as cities down. The sin of a city will literally drag it down into darkness. And God cares not only for the individual, Jonah, but also for the cities that have fallen into darkness because of sin, Nineveh. See, there's this, this great picture that's, that's being painted by God, that he's this God that cares both for the individual salvation and for the city salvation. And I do think, though, when we look at this story, we have to understand that we are coming from a place where we just came out of two years um, in a pandemic, where we've essentially, as I would say, uh, as a nation, lost faith in our institutions, broadly speaking, that were supposed to protect us, 
that we have not only seen corruption in politicians, but also corruption uh, in civilians. Um, we have looting and rioting and people treating each other with utter disdain and distaste because they have an R or a D behind their name. We have people that oh, where we're, we're literally doing just evil and wicked things to everybody. We treat other people like animals. Sin brings us down into dark places. It always leads us down. But we're also witnessing, I would say, a justice crisis because where there's sin and sin abounds, there's also going to be a justice crisis. And we have right now criminals being let out of jail um, while good men and women who would just pray outside of abortion facilities would be put in jail. Um, it all seems backwards. Today it seems like you can murder somebody and be out of jail in a matter of years um, or you could misgender somebody and be fired from your job. Loved ones, it's not a very far stretch of the imagination for us to not only identify with Jonah, the person, but also with Nineveh, the city. Sin brings down entire cities. I believe that not only was Nineveh sinfully wicked, but there's, I think, evidence to support that this city was on the brinks, uh, brink of collapse and chaos. The people of, city, of the city were probably greatly troubled, greatly distressed, and Jonah knew that if they heard a word from God, they would probably listen to it. If they heard that God might spare them, they might listen to it. But you see, if word had gotten out from Nineveh and Jonah knew about it from Israel, and they, they, did you hear about how terrible Nineveh was? That's not the place you want to live. It's a terrible city. It's a terrible place to live. The people there are garbage. The people there are in utter distress and chaos. They're starving. Um, there's insane things happening, like a blood moon just happened um, right around the same time that Jonah was being sent, and there was a great famine in the land. A lot of things are set up the stage for this city to be in great distress, and Jonah could have just shrugged his shoulders, and he probably did at, in the beginning. Well, they deserve it, right? They deserve it. They're terrible people. They're sinful people. They're violent people. They're wicked people. They deserve to burn. But that's not the attitude that our God has for cities. Far from that, in fact, that we have a God that loves not only his chosen people, but in the entire world. Um, and he's sending his prophet to give this troubled city a word. I believe that Jonah knew, knew about that, and he, was, he, didn't, he, he rebelled against God, right? He ran from God because he did not want to give this city any hope. He thought that they deserved their impending doom. So, we come to chapter 3 now, and here we have... Jonah spit up on dry land, and God speaking to Jonah once again. Let's go ahead and read Jonah chapter 3 together. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it in the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go out into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh, Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. He issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God and let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said that he would do to them, and he did not do it. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, would you give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. Father, we know that your word, the word of God, is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. So I ask now, Lord, that you would show us your ways, lead us in your truth, and teach us. 
Father, there certainly is a Jonah in each one of us, Lord, the spirit of Jonah in each of us, reluctant to obey, stubborn to repent, and slow to love the world like you do. But Lord, I think we can also relate with Nineveh. Lord, a city that is on the brink, a city that deserves judgment, a city of wicked people that ultimately heard your word and repented. Lord, may we repent and obey your word. May we faithfully bring it to others around us and may we see a great repentance and revival in our days during these troubled times. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it actually mirrors Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, where God, the word of the Lord, comes to Jonah and tells him, go to Nineveh. Um, in fact, it's an interesting, uh, almost poetic form, um, how in the book of Jonah is written. There's a lot of um, really great and rich um, richness to the book of Jonah, and it's hard to get all of that into one message, quite honestly. But we have Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, where God says to Noah, go, and Noah says no. Chapter 3, verse 1, God says to Jonah a second time, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. This is the second time, again, that God sends his word to Jonah. And I gotta just say, as a loving parent, right, as a loving parent, you often have to repeat what you tell your kids, right? So if it's, hey, go clean your room, go pick up, go take out the trash, um, make your bed, whatever that is, you have to repeat it over and over and over again. Um, and as a loving parent, uh, my mom was famous for repeating herself 10 times, right? Some of you probably have moms. Some of you probably are moms just like that, where you repeat yourself 10 times. And we used to kind of make fun of my mom for repeating herself 10 times, but now as a parent of a toddler, a two-year-old, I completely understand why. You see, I can tell my two, I've told my two-year-old daughter, I'll tell you guys just a short story, to put her toys away before bed. So it's okay, go ahead and let's put your Legos back in the bin that they go in and let's get ready for bed. And what's the first thing that she does? She gets up with a big smile on her face and runs to the opposite side of the house. Oh, well, that's disobedience, a little bit like Jonah. God tells him to do something, and what's the first thing that he does is he runs. So what do I do is, well, instead of putting my daughter in her room on a timeout for three days and three nights, I gave her three minutes. And after uh, not even a minute, she's in there bawling her eyes out and just so sorry that she wasn't listening and she knew that she did something wrong. So I open the door, and she comes running to me. I'm so sorry, Daddy. I'm so sorry, and I won't do it. You know, does the whole two-year-old thing. I look at her and say, well, are, you're sorry, I forgive you. Now let's, again, I tell her again, let's go clean up your Legos and put them in the bin. And I give her a second chance. You see, I think that in, very much, in a very real sense, God is, as, as our Heavenly Father, like that. The God of second chances, right? A lot of times we want to test God. And we say, well, God told me to do this, and, and it's very clear that he told me to do this. And I have an entire Bible of things that he's told me to do. And I ran the other way. So if you've ever felt like you messed up, like you failed to do what God wanted, and now you feel like God's done with me. He told me to do something, I didn't do it, and now I, he's done with me, right? Now he's done with me. I just want to tell you that he still loves you. He's still going to walk with you. He's not done with you. And for a second time, God will come back to you and tell you the same thing. But you see, there can be consequences to those actions, though. When we disobey God, there's divine consequences. For Jonah, it was three days in the belly of a whale. For my daughter, it was three minutes sitting on her bed <laughs> crying. God tells Jonah the same command, go to Nineveh and call out against it what I tell you. This is important for us to understand that the prophets of God were responsible for one thing. They were responsible to convey the word of God, nothing more and nothing less. He cannot add to it or subtract from it. And in fact, Deuteronomy 4, chapter 4, verse 2, which we've been studying the book of Deuteronomy as cross-connection um, for a while now, and you might recall from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, it said, You shall not add to the word that I commanded you, nor shall you take from it, that you may keep the commands of the Lord your God that I commanded you. And there's a similar warning for us found in the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation. 
um, where God says that the very curses found in the book of Revelation will be added unto you if you add or subtract from the book of Revelation, which is very interesting. The word of God is divine and it is incredibly sacred. You see, here at Cross Connection Church, this pulpit and this platform that we carry, that we have right here, is sacred in the sense that you're not going to hear our pastors here telling you what they think. You're not going to hear our pastors here pontificating about things going on in the world. You're going to hear them tell you the Word of God and how it applies to our life. The Word of God, we aren't going to add to it, we aren't going to subtract from it. We're going to take out from the Word of God exegetically, meaning that we're looking at the historical context of a passage, and then we're going to look at what it meant for the people that it was originally given to, and then how it you know, affects us today. You see, this isn't just a place for you to come and hear from Pastor Miles or Pastor Mark or Pastor Jason or Pastor Garrett. It's a place for you to come and hear from God. And we hold a high reverence on this pulpit. It's a place for followers of Jesus to come, to be refined, to be refilled, to be renewed, and to sent out to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to the nations. You see, that's the sole purpose of the church, right? The church, the body of Christ is the believers getting together, encouraging one another, and then going out into the world, accomplishing the great commission for which God has sent us. And my job is to inspire you, the listener, whether you're listening right now in 2023 or five years from now, or five months from now. It is inspired to you to hear the word of God and to obey it. So, Jonah he arose in obedience and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth, and Jonah began going into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. There are, again, divine consequences for sin. The consequences of, of sin for Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, right? It was the bleaching of his skin, which likely would have occurred in the belly of the whale as the stomach acids literally bleached all of the hair off of his body. But then the consequence was also, instead of being able to travel to Nineveh with his wallet and, like Mark mentioned, all of the um, comforts of modern-day travel that he could have possibly gone with before he had sinned, he now had to go as a bleached man with no wallet, no money, no resources, and he's now literally spit up on a, the shore of a beach in the middle of the Middle East. And if you haven't been to the Middle East, it's mostly desert. So now he has to travel roughly 500 miles or so in this condition, and it's very likely that word spread rapidly that there's this crazy prophet of God that just got spit up out of a whale, smells like a fish, and he's completely bleached and he's traveling across the desert to this city called Nineveh to give them a word. I'm just throwing that out there again. That part is, is speculation for the most part. However, that's Pastor Garrett speaking, not necessarily the God speaking, but I'm just saying we can imagine that that is probably what happened because to travel 500 miles in that day would have taken time, about a month, depending on how fast you can travel every day. And not only that, but you don't have a car, you don't have an airplane, so you're traveling on foot and then you're also relying on the hospi uh, hospitality of strangers to feed you, to give you water. Um, so you're going from city to city and staying until you can make your way all the way to Nineveh. Um, he gets to Nineveh and wants to deliver this message from the Lord, right? And some scholars believe that there was a custom um, of dignitaries in this time period. Um, where prophets would usually spend about three days in a city. The first two days was establishing who they were and why they were there, and the third day would be proclaiming the word that the Lord had given them for that city. We don't necessarily know if that's true in this case or not, um, and that's not really what we need to know about this story, though. What we need to know about this story is that Jonah entered into the city, and as soon as he proclaimed the word that God had given him to the people of, of Nineveh, they immediately were believed in the word of God and repented. There was an immediate response upon hearing the word of God where they believed the word of God. It doesn't say they believed the word of Jonah. It says they believed the word of God. And that's why, again, we hold a high value on the word of God. And you can say that 
as soon as they, they heard this, they repented and imme immediately, and this message that he was giving went viral. It was only on the first day of the three days that he would spend in Nineveh that this message virally went across the community. All of the, all of the civilians in this community, all the people in this community heard it, spread this word, and they immediately took action to repent, to put on sackcloth, and to sit in ash, to even you know, call, call for a fast, which means you stop eating. You see, this message spread throughout the city faster than Jonah could even preach it. God loves cities. Why? God loves cities because I, I believe oh, cities are full of people. God loves people. He made us in his own image. But more importantly, I think, culture flows out of cities. Culture flows out of cities. And there, this repentance, this revival of Nineveh likely had waves of impacts in the community more broadly speaking. If you can reach a city, it'll impact a far greater amount of people. The culture that comes out of that city will impact the culture of that nation. Paul, on his missionary journeys, specifically, strategically targeted large cities as he went, avoiding these small cities, avoiding towns to go to large cities where he could minister and there would be greater impact, right? There was a strategic mentality to that because he knew if I can reach these larger cities, then those cities will take that word to the smaller cities, right? There's a strategic plan there. Nineveh's repentance, though, um, it, it did not begin from the top down. It began from the bottom up. It began as a grassroots movement. It began as a, a grassroots repentance, if you will. Whereas the, the common people, right, the me's and you's of, of, the, of, the, of the nation, of that city, they repented and that repentance went viral. And I got to tell you guys, point number two, if you're following along on the outline, is that genuine repentance has divine consequences. Right? We talked about the divine consequence of sin. Genuine repentance has divine consequences too. Genuine repentance, I think, is paired with physical change. When it says that they believed God's word and then they called for a fast and put on sackcloth, there was an immediate response physically to that word where you put on this super uncomfortable clothes called sackcloth, which would be itchy and scratchy and not comfortable. Why would somebody do that? Why would somebody stop eating and put on this incredibly uncomfortable outfit? Well, just like in baptism, as baptism is a symbolic representation of what God has changed and done on the inside of you, and we're, it's the, the symbolic picture of what God's done on the inside is going on on the outside, right? Like that we're shedding the old self. Right? We've become a new man. We've been born again. It's the same thing with putting on sackcloth and ash is a symbolic form of repentance. It's saying that I'm as uncomfortable outside with myself and my body as I am with my sin inwardly. Right? My sin disgusts me. I am ashamed of my sin. I'm I have an incredible discomfort and distaste in my sin. And I am sorry, God. And they stopped eating and they put on this, this really uncomfortable clothing to symbolize that outwardly, what, they, what was going on inwardly, I think. Then the word reached the king of Nineveh. So again, this started as a grassroots thing. It did not start from the king. The word reached the king and he arose from his throne, removed his royal robes. He covered himself with sackcloth and he sat in ashes. Even their king repented. He got off his throne. He took off his royal robe. He took on this position of one who is genuinely repentant and publicly did that too. And he issues this proclamation throughout Nineveh, by decree of the king and his nobles, let either man, neither man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. So he's saying, you can't eat and your animals can't eat. Nothing that eats can eat here right now, right? Don't even drink water. But let man and beast be covered in sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil ways and the violence that is in his hand. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Imagine you wake up one day and our nation is flying its flag at half mast. And we find out that it's a new public holiday. So all the schools are closed. All the kids are at home. And it's this public national day of observance, um, national holiday, we could say, that's called uh, We're Evil and We're Sorry. So, okay, it's the, the We're the Evil and We're Sorry day of repentance. Could you imagine, though, if our president came out 
on live TV saying, I repent and we all should. We royally screwed up. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, he says, God may turn and relent and turn his fierce anger from us that we might not perish. You know, it's like basically this king is saying, I sure hope that God does not treat us like we've treated other people, like we've treated the Hebrews, like we've treated the Israelites. I sure hope that God does not treat us with the violence that we've treated other people with. You see, even the animals in Nineveh were not to eat or drink or to be covered, and they were, were to be covered with sackcloth just like the people. And I think what that tells me is that this was a very serious repentance. This was not a joke to these people. This was not them just playing a game or going with the flow or going with the culture. Or this was not just some new fad in Nineveh. This was genuine, heartfelt repentance. From deep within every soul's, every single person's heart, they were repenting to God. You see, here this would be like our president essentially saying, we need to cry out to God Almighty and turn from our evil ways and our violence. You see, because who knows? Right? It's this, this who knows. The king of Nineveh had absolutely no idea who God was like Jonah knew who God was. See, Jonah knew that God was a merciful, loving, caring, compassionate God. He knew that God was a patient God. But you see, the Ninevites had no idea that God was like that at all. They had no idea of God's character like that. They had no assurance that God wasn't a God that who was just going to, well, for the lack of better words, smite you just because you were, wrong, you were evil. Who knows? The Ninevites did not know the character of God like Jonah did. And in fact, they had no idea that God was merciful. No concept of God who was even like that. Who knows? Let's, let's tell God that we're sorry and let's see. Maybe, just maybe he won't judge us. But Jonah knew the whole time that, that God was like that. That God was a God who forgives and even because the Ninevites, even, even when the Ninevites did not know that God was like that, they still repented anyways. That's the great story here, is that the Ninevites, these wicked people, these hurting wicked people, didn't know a God that was merciful, or a God that loved them, or a God that was compassionate towards them, or a God who was patient with them, and yet they repented anyways. Meaning like, well, most gods that they worship probably would have just decided, well, no, you're going to be gone in 40, day, in 40 days and it doesn't matter what you do. So live it up and you got 40 days to live it up. And that's, that's, that's that because I'm not going to change my mind from judging you to not judging you. But you see, they repented anyways, genuinely repented anyways. And this all happened because they believed in God's word. You see, they were given... Five words, what Jonah told them was five words in the Hebrew or five words in the Assyrian language. Five words is what it boils down to. And uh, five words of the Lord and these people repented. They, they did not have an entire Bible. They did not have an entire Bible like we do. They heard five words of God and they responded to them and repented and that brought them to salvation. We have the entirety of scriptures. And this brings me to the point that the Word of God is powerful, right? But point number three on your outline is this. Because we have the entire Word of God, our job is to faithfully proclaim the Word of God and leave the results to the God of the Word. Our job is to faithfully proclaim the Word of God and leave the results to the God of the Word. And when God saw what they did, right? When God's word was proclaimed and the people repented and they responded and God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it. Did God change his mind? I would definitely say no. See, some people say that there's a, a big problem here because God said he would judge them in 40 days, that they would be overrun, and God changed his mind by not doing that. Well, you see, I think that God is actually faithful to his word. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 and 8, it says this, and you can read along on the screen. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up, break down, and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. You see, 
God was actually perfectly in line with his word, with his character, when he relented from judging Nineveh. Did they deserve it? Absolutely. But we have a merciful God who in his great mercy, when we repent, gives us a second chance and a third chance and a hundredth chance. Why? Because 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says it pretty well, that God is not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, he wants and desires for all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth in Jesus Christ. You see, God's five words, 40 days and enough, right? 40 days and you're finished. 40 days and you're going to be overrun, overthrown. That could have certainly been a paraphrase of what God really told Noah, I mean Jonah to say. But that doesn't really matter. What we know is that when God's word was heard, they took it seriously. When God's word was heard, these people took it seriously. They took the judgment of God seriously. And you know what? It was the mercy of God that gave them up to 40 days to repent. They didn't need it. They repented on the first day. They repented on the first day. And God said, 40 days and you're going to be judged, right? And Nineveh repented and got right with God on that first day. That 40 days time period, though, God could have just said, you've messed up, you're done. Right? One strike, you're out. But you see, this is God's mercy at work. This is God's mercy when God sent his only begotten son while we were yet sinners into the world. Right? God sent his son while we were yet sinners. Sin always leads us down. And when you sin and when you persist in sin, it's going to bring you down. As sin brought Jonah down, as sin brought Samson down, Samson's a great story. In fact, one of the greatest ones, one of the great servants of God, Samson, the judge of God that had his time, right? God was gracious with Samson's sin. For up to 20 years, he was patient with Samson's sin. He put up with Samson's sin, all of his shenanigans, right? This is somebody that was specifically put aside for God's plan, for God's purpose, for God's will. He was a judge of God under a Nazarite vow. It doesn't get much more strict than that. And he played with that and he sinned. For 20 years, God put up with that until a time when God finally said, enough. Right? There's going to be a time where God says, I've been patient enough. I've given you enough chances. Enough. And what happened with Samson is he experienced the divine judgment of God. Because sin, his sin, ended up leaving him bound. Right? He was captured. He was bound by his sin. He was blinded by his sin. And ultimately, he died because of his sins. Samson experienced the divine consequences of his sin and the judgment of God. And you might say, well, Garrett, I have a relationship with God. I'm religious, so I'm good. And to that, I'll say, Jonah had a relationship with God too. And he was happy to follow God until it became inconvenient and uncomfortable for him. Like, God, go serve uh, somebody that you don't like. How about um, go share your faith with somebody that you don't want to? You know, it's, it's inconvenient. It's uncomfortable. Go share your faith with somebody. Um, how about caring for lost, evil, broken people who don't know their right from their left, that are utterly confused, and go share your faith with them? Doesn't this sound like our society today? Doesn't this sound like our church today? The, the church has the spirit of Jonah. We just We want to serve God until it's inconvenient for us, until it's uncomfortable for us. See, Jonah had a hard time desiring for evil people that also happened to inhabit the same earth that he did, right, for them to come to repentance, right? These are people that he distasted. I mean, he hated these people. And he did not have the heart of God for these people. He did not have any desire that they could be saved and come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see... I think we need to have that heart, the heart of Christ. The heart that all people on the earth need to know Jesus Christ and come to, uh, to meet the God of the Bible, the God that we serve. You see, God was merciful to Jonah, and God was merciful to the Ninevites, and God has been merciful to you and to me. And there's two different kinds of attitudes that we can have when it comes to serving God. It's the I have to serve God and have to do His will, or I get to serve God and I get to do His will. You see, I think Jonah went into this with the, I have to, 
mentality, right? I have to do. I have to go to Nineveh. God, no, I'm, I'm going the other way. And some some Christians today, we I have to serve in hospitality. I have to serve in the kids ministry. I have to serve in the youth ministry. I have to do this or have to do that. I have to go to service. Instead of, I get to serve the living God, the God who's been merciful with me and my sin, the God who saved me out of the, the, the depths, right? Because the picture of us being saved in our sin by Jesus Christ is literally us, Jonah, being Jonah in that whale and us being raised to new life in Christ, us being spit up on the shore and given another chance. And that brings me to my point number four, that Jesus is the perfect Jonah. The Father sent Jesus, and Jesus stepped off of his throne, took off his royal robes, and became a man so he could seek and save those who were lost. Interestingly enough, you might not know this, but Jonah came from a town called Geth Hefer, which, um, if I hopefully I said that right, which is just a few miles north of Nazareth in Galilee being the only, other, only prophet in the Old Testament to come from the region of Galilee. Now, you might also be familiar that Jesus himself came from Nazareth in Galilee, which is pretty interesting. And Jesus, is the, uh, Jesus, Jesus in his ministry, the only prophet that, that he compares himself to and his ministry to is Jonah. So let's read what he had to say about Jonah in Luke chapter 11. You can go to either Luke chapter 11, but I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 says, Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. See, this is where I get Jesus really did believe that Jonah was in a fish. This actually happened. And he says, The men of Nineveh, this is what's interesting. We'll rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and the five words that he gave them, right? And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Like Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, Jesus would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh were going to rise up and condemn that nation because, you see, they had this crazy prophet that traveled 500 miles after being spit up by a great fish, um, just a crazy prophet that smelled fishy, and he's telling them five words that God gave them to tell, to tell them, five words of the Lord, right? Five words of the Lord, and these people repented, not knowing that God even would be forgiving God. They repented genuinely. And then Jesus comes, the Word of God, God himself in the flesh, the Word of God here on the earth, and they did not listen to him. When Jesus said something far greater than Jonah is here, he was right. See, there's a lot of similarities between Jonah and Jesus, and I'll go through them. Jonah preached repentance. Jesus also taught and preached repentance. Jonah brought a great revival to a boat first, and then a city. And Jesus brings revival to the whole world. Jonah traveled from Israel to Nineveh. Jesus traveled from heaven to earth. Jonah went unwillingly. Jesus went willingly. Jonah came out of a fish alive. Jesus came out of the grave alive. Jonah preached five words of God. Jesus came as the word of God. Jonah saw a great king get off of his throne and repent. Jesus was the great king who stepped off of his throne that we might repent. Jonah gave the Ninevites 40 days to repent. Jesus has given us thousands of years. Jesus is the perfect Jonah. Jesus is the way that we experience the mercy of God in its fullness. He's the way that we receive forgiveness. He's the way that we, you and I, are reconciled to God. It is Jesus who sent us out on this mission to our community, to our friends, to our relatives, to our acquaintances, and to our neighbors. And we don't go alone. He says, behold, I'm sending you a helper, a divine helper, the spirit of Christ that we get to have inhabit our own lives and go with us on our mission to share this good news that Jesus Christ has come to save the world. And you see, we have not only five words of God 
to bring to the, the two lost and dying and evil and violent people in our, in our lives and in this world. We have the entire Bible church. We have the entire word of God in our hands. And I'm excited to see what God is going to do with that this year through Cross Connection. And you might be asking, well, is there really any hope for the United States? What would it look like if there was widespread repentance here like there was in Nineveh? I think we as Christians, we often pray for revival. We often talk about revival. Oh, it'd be so great if our nation would just repent and be revived. And if we just turn back to Christ, we often desire revival, but we don't want to do any of the work to get there because the spirit of Jonah is too strong in us, right? We don't want to bring the word of God to those around us. See, things were really bad in Nineveh. And I think as we start to see people repenting and turning from their evil ways here, right? It's not going to be sackcloth and ashes, but we will see the effects of great repentance here in the United States. What will that effect be like? Well, it'll be like abortion facilities closed down because there's going to be no need for them, right? It's going to be adoption agencies um, downsizing because all of their kids have been adopted. It's going to be porn sites completely shut down because nobody's going to be going to them anymore. It's going to be social media like TikTok completely banned and wiped off the face of the earth or nuked for all I care because it's evil. Why? Because there's not going to be a need for that when the hearts of men are changed by the word of God and the spirit of God. You see, when the word of God comes, the word of God comes with power. That's why I can tell you the word of God and that's all I need to do. I can tell you what happened in the Word of God. I can tell you the Word of God. That's all that I need to do is be the messenger of the Word of God and let the God of the Word do the rest. Because the Word of God has power. That same power that Jonah had in preaching to Nineveh is available to you and to me. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That word power, right? which is also used to talk about the word of God. That word power in the, in the Greek is dunamis. And dunamis is where we derive our word dynamite from. And it gives me this picture that the word of God has this explosive power in my life and in this world. That when I'm just faithful to proclaim the word of God, even if it's five words, that's enough. There's enough power in those five words to bring nations and cities and people to repentance. You see, you don't need to know the entire word of God perfectly to share the gospel and the word of God with other people. But in what you do know, be faithful to share. And my parting question for you today is, we've explored the mercy of God in Jonah's life, in Nineveh, in the city, right? But I ask you this, do you know how many days you have left? If I was to tell you today, you have 40 days left, right? And then you're dead, then you're gone. What would your response be? Because we do not know our final day, our final hour. But death is 100% certain for every single one of us. Do you know how many days you have left until the consequences of your sin catches up with you? Until God says, I'm done being patient, enough is enough. And you're going to experience a divine consequence for your sin, which is death. Right? When is that going to be for you? I implore you, there's coming a day when God is going to say enough where you are going to be judged for your sins. Repent, believe in the good news that Jesus Christ lived a life that we could not live, a perfect life. That he came off his throne in heaven, lived that life that we could not live, and then he died a death that we deserved in our place, bearing the punishment, the penalty of our sins. And then he rose from the grave, three after three days in the grave, he rose to new life so that way you and I could experience new life in him. Now my question to you is not, are you saved? No, no, that's not the right question, I don't think. Because you can say, oh, yes, I, I prayed a prayer. Yes, I, I said I believe. My question today is, does Jesus live in you? Does Jesus live in you? Because Unlike any other God that we can study throughout history that has been worshipped, the Lord Jesus is the God who wants to dwell in you. And he sent his spirit to come and inhabit your life and to start transforming you from the inside out 
changing our character to match our calling, empowering us and making the word of God known to us that we could be bold in proclaiming it to the nations, to our, our friends, our relatives, our neighbors, our acquaintances. It's not the church's job to evangelize Escondido. It's your job and it's my job. The church is a place for Christians, believers to come and be built up, to be strengthened and encouraged and resent out to go do that work. In our everyday life, it's our responsibility to proclaim the word of God. Nothing more, nothing less. See, I do believe that as Jesus transforms our character to match our calling from the inside out by the power of the Holy Spirit, when he dwells in us, he gets rid of sin in us, he makes us sinless, we're becoming more like Jesus, the perfect Jonah. And then we might see a great revival and repentance in our generation. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord, that you are merciful. Lord, I thank you that you were merciful with Jonah. You gave him a second chance. I thank you that you were merciful with Nineveh. You gave them a second chance. And you've been merciful with us and you've given us a second chance. By sending your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, you not only gave us a second chance, but you gave the world a second chance. Father, may your word come in power in our lives, dealing with any sin that remains. Lord, may those that are listening today, that are tuning in right now, Lord, whatever sin is in their life, may they repent and turn to your word and believe in it. Lord, may your word come in power and may we see a great repentance and a great revival in this generation as we turn and obey your word. So forgive us, Lord, for our sins. Lord, count not our sins against us. Lord, make whatever sin in our life is there still absolutely, utterly disgusting and uncomfortable to us as sackcloth was on the Ninevites. Now, Father, I pray that you would bless them and keep them, cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them. Father, may we be faithful to carry out the great commission which Jesus has sent us on to go and tell the world of the good news that Christ saves, that salvation is found in him. May we not have the spirit of Jonah, Lord, and not run from your great command. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may God bless you guys. And have a great week. And please remember, tune in next week. Pastor Miles will be with us, and he's going to be covering the final chapter in this Jonah series. And I know we've got some amazing things to share with you next week. So tune in for that. But God bless you guys. We'll see you later. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing.
Thanks for joining us for our broadcast today. I pray that you were greatly encouraged by it. And we here at Cross Connection Church would love to invite you to join us in person next week on Sunday at 8.30 and 10.30 services. Um, so if you can make it, again, 8.30 and 10.30 services here at Cross Connection Church in Escondido, California. We'd love to see you there. And of course, if you want any more information about Cross Connection Church, check us out on our website, lifeinconnection.com. God bless you guys and have a wonderful week. My name is Sarah Springfield. Uh, I've been at this church since um, I was young enough to actually be a ch child in children's ministry. <laughs> And I'm Noah Springfield, and I've been at this church for about eight years. I think we started with children's ministry because um, after the church was coming back together after COVID and meeting in person, because we have four children of our own, really wanted there to be a children's ministry again. And we figured that to make that happen, we should be a part of it. Yeah, there was an announcement uh, one morning and I kind of gave Sarah the nudge, like, hey, that's something we can do. You know, it wasn't something that was jumping out at me, but hey, there's something we can do. and. It's been awesome so far. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things that Noah likes to say whenever we're considering uh, serving somewhere is he always asks the question, you know, is there a reason not to? <laughs> and um, I think that's a big impetus. You know, when there's a need, is there a reason why we can't do this? Is it going to interfere with something with our family? If not, if it's something we can fit in, then, you know, if there's a need, let's fill it. God opened the door for a reason. Mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest things that serving in children's ministry has really impressed upon me um, and changed my perspective about is just how much of a community we are as a church. When I'm in here with the children, some of them are my friend's kids. Some of them are the children of people I've never met. Some of them are children of people who maybe uh, don't know the Lord. But it's my job when, you know, it's, it's our job when we're in here to share the love of Jesus to all these different children from all these different places and all these different families. Yeah, and it's really been awesome to see. I mean, it kind of brings the church community a little bit more together for me. You know, you know, knowing the families, knowing the kids, uh, it's it's really kind of opened up relationships and, and uh, you know, opened up a lot of opportunities to talk that I wouldn't have normally had. And, and it's cool just hanging out with kids. Um, we get to play a lot of games and build stuff, which is pretty much my level. Um, and I think with Noah and I, I mean, Obviously, we're, I mean, we're parents. We've been parents for almost 15 years now. And we've developed kind of a teamwork thing. There are things that I'm strong in. There's things that Noah's strong in. Uh, while I'm teaching the lesson, Noah's really great at, you know, distracting, you know, kids that are, you know, maybe playing with toys or, you know, maybe have a little bit more energy. Noah's really good at taking that on. I give him all the, all the, the cutout stuff. <laughs> Well, it's really good to give us kind of an opportunity to, to do things different, right? She's, you know, more in control in the classroom, and Lee and I get to see that side of her, which is really cool. And I get to watch uh, children, lots of children, tackling my husband every, every week. Oh, <laughs> That's a good time, too. I would encourage anybody to join children's ministry who has experience around children, who loves children, who uh, doesn't mind being tackled occasionally, maybe, who likes to play with toys with children. <laughs> Even people who maybe aren't, you know, maybe that's not an ministry you think you're going to be into. If it's where the door is open, give it a shot. I, you know, thought I was going to be a frontline missionary, but this is where God opened the door, so it's turned out awesome. I, you know, just got to give it a chance and uh, see what happens. God does awesome things. And again, there's that question. Is there a reason not to? So big thank you to Sarah and Noah and the rest of our children's ministry volunteers. Hey, if you guys want to sign up to help in Kidsmen, lifeandconnection.com forward slash serve. So lifeandconnection.com forward slash serve if you'd like to sign up to help in children's ministry or any of our other ministries.